morning. morning. We understand that Pastor Madden is in the house. We invite you up to the pulpit if you like. Amen. 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 Before we get started, let's uh, just congratulate our own pastor on 20 plus one years. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You see, it's good to be a somebody that tells everybody about Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us stand. It is a man that time for our benevolent offering. Let us pray. Father, it's again that we come to you as humble as we know how. And we say thank you for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Father, we could thank you all day and still not thank you enough. Father, now this morning we're going to give back some of that that you have blessed us with for those that are less fortunate than ourselves. And we ask you to accept them from our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Hallelujah. Awesome and healer, 
Baptist Temple Food Pantry. After a long absence due to Hurricane Sandy, the food pantry will be reorganizing and soon resume. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Volunteers are needed. Anyone interested in joining this ministry, please contact Sharon Lewis or Sister Brenda Winstead. Additional information is to follow. Those are our brief announcements. Please remember those that cannot make it to church. Send a card, make a phone call, or a physical visit. Have a blessed day. Next Saturday at 6 o'clock, our own mail for us will be in a part of a concert for the Free Mother's Day concert. And that's at uh, Camden Bethany Church. Calvary. Calvary Missionary Church in Camden. Uh, it's on the bulletin board. Uh, it's posted, and if you need the address, you can get in contact with get in contact with me. We do have it written down. But that's next Saturday at six o'clock. Our praise dance team will also be attending Amen. that night. It's a free Mother's Day concert, free will offering. Amen. Good morning again. Do we have any birthdays, anniversaries since last Sunday? Birthdays, anniversaries. Amen.
remarks this morning. If so, would you please stand, say a word if you like, or just stand and say amen. Everybody belong. Amen to that. Amen.
Let's give the male choir a hand. The temple airs. Brother Darrell, thank you for coming this morning. God bless you. Listen, God is good all the time, and he's worthy to be praised. I'm so blessed to see my mother sitting out here last week this time. We were waiting for some test results, and I want to tell you that God is good. Amen. So we bless and we praise the Lord just for having the opportunity to stand here. And I do want to personally thank Reverend Bay for the 26 years that he's been here administering the gospel unto us, the unadulterated gospel of God. And I've heard other preachers say he is a preacher's preacher. And, and it is a challenge to all of us ministers to not get up here and just preach some bootleg stuff. We, we have to study to show ourselves approved because he does the same. And so, and so it is just a blessing to be under his tutelage and his guidance for these 26 years. Amen. And Ms. Bates, we thank you also. We know that you've been upholding him and that you've been behind him all the way, and we, we bless God for you as well. Amen. We're glad to see Minister Page here with us who was a minister, a member of Union Baptist Temple, who is now a member of Resurrection New Covenant Ministry where the pastor, D.L. Samuel, um, D.L. Samuel Madden is the pastor, a great man of God, a great preacher and pastor of the Resurrection New Covenant Church. And it is so befitting, it's so ironic that he's here because the title of this message is A New and Better Covenant. Let us pray. Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. A covenant. We hear about covenants throughout scripture. But what is a covenant? A covenant is a contract, an agreement, or a promise made between two or more parties where one or more of those parties will benefit. Now, some covenants can be conditional and some covenants can be unconditional. In fact, there were eight covenants throughout Scripture. Two of those covenants were conditional and, one of the, and, eight, and six of those covenants were unconditional. For instance, here is a conditional covenant. When you go to get your card, and you sign on the dotted line, and you say that I agree to make these payments so that I can drive this car, and you will get your money. That's a condition. The condition is based on if you pay your money, you get to keep your car. That's the condition. When you, pay, when you, when you, get, your, when you get your cell phone bill, or when you sign up for your cell phone, as long as you pay your payments, you get to talk on your phone. That's a conditional covenant. An unconditional covenant will be, at the church, I will give you $300. For what? I'm just going to give it to you. That's a promise that I give. It's unconditional, not based on anything that you've done. And that's an unconditional covenant. And so God in Scripture has made conditional and unconditional covenants. Our Scripture says, but he has obtained a more excellent ministry by how he also is a mediator of a better covenant with better promises. Seven says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. Now we're skipping to verse 10. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I shall be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. We're skipping to verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. A new and better covenant. In the Garden of Eden, God made a covenant with Adam. 
It was called the Edenic Covenant, or called, it was also known as the Covenant of Works. And he told Adam basically this, I want you to be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and you may eat of any tree in this garden. You may eat of any of the fruit in this garden, but the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil you shall not eat. Because the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Adam was promised life, and he was promised blessings, and he was promised to keep his position in the garden as long as he kept his part of the covenant. As long as he was obedient to the demand of God when he said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the penalty will be death. The penalty would have been spiritual death, and eventually, physical death. All right. Well, what was wrong with having knowledge of good and evil? God didn't want them to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What would have been wrong with eating from a tree that would contain knowledge of what, what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad? Why were they not allowed to know that? Why didn't God want them to know that? And it's this simple. He didn't say you can eat of the good branches and not the evil branches. He said, don't take part in the tree because God never intended for man, for Adam and Eve to know what was good and what was right and what was wrong, what was good and what was evil because the concentration wouldn't have been on him. The concentration would have been on what was right and what was wrong. He wanted them to know him. He didn't want them to know what was good and what was wrong and what was right and what was evil. He wanted them to simply have a relationship with him. And out of the relationship with God, all right and wrong is incidental because it all comes from a relationship with God. So we know the story. We know that they ate anyway because of Satan. We know they ate. And this simply shows that man couldn't keep God's commandments even when he was in direct relationship with God. The Bible says that Adam walked with God or God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. He was in direct relationship with God, but yet and still could not keep the commandments. Of God. This one act of obedience changed the way that man and God's relationship would be forever. Instead of man being born spiritual because, they, because of Adam and Eve eating of the tree, man is now born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Instead of man living eternally on the earth, man will now return to the dust and eventual death. And then we said, well, you know what? God was mad at Adam and Eve, and so he kicked them out of the garden. And that's not so. God was showing mercy. When he excluded them from the garden, it was his mercy. Why? Because in that garden was the tree of life. And if they had partaken of the tree of life in the state that they were in, they would have lived forever, and man would have been eternally separated from God. So he had to exclude them from the garden to keep them from eating from the tree of life because we'd have all been separated from God. So God knew and God understood that a covenant where man had to keep his part wasn't going to work. It just would not work. But he was determined to bring salvation to man. So God made a covenant with the man Abram. And he simply says this to Abram. We know his name was later changed to Abraham. He says this to Abram. Genesis 12, 1 says, the Lord said to Abram, we can stop right there. What did Abram even do to deserve the Lord to say anything to him? Because Abram was from the city of Ur. And in the city of Ur, they worshiped the God of the sun and the moon and, the, and fire and the stars. And he didn't deserve, Abraham wasn't even thinking about God. It says that the city was an evil and a wicked city. So Abraham's concentration wasn't on God, but yet God said to Abraham. We find him making a covenant with Abraham. He says, it says this. God told Abraham, listen, get out of your country, get from your family, get away from your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. And then he tells him that I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless you. And I will curse them that curse you. And in these things shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Yeah. Yeah. This is a covenant. This is a promise. 
of God's grace. It is unconditional. Listen, in the Edenic covenant, he said, Adam, you do your part. You get to keep your spot and everything is good. But if you don't, you're going to die. But he told Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them who bless you. And I will curse them who curse you. I will. I will. I will. You shall. I will. That's the covenant that God made with Abraham. It was an unconditional covenant. Something the Bible goes on, it, says, it starts in verse 4, it says, So Abraham departed, and Lot, his nephew, went with him. God just said, leave your family. He told him to leave your family behind, and he took his nephew with him. So if God was going to judge Abraham based on him keeping his part, it would have all been done right there. It would have, it would have been finished right there. But God made a promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through him. So anyway, he took Lot with him. And if we read the scripture, and we know that Lot got in him into a lot of trouble. But he took Lot in. And but listen, even during, during his travel, um, Abraham even lied. Er, um, Sarah was about, his wife Sarah was about 65, 70, 65, 60, 70 years old. And he told Sarah, listen, you know, as we travel... Um, when we get to the Egyptians, you know, they're going to want you because, you know, you're really looking good at 65 years old. You know, so they, they, they're, going, they, they're going to want you. So listen, tell them you're my sister, you know. And so, you know, you go in the house and do your, it's okay if they harm you, but I don't want them to kill me, so to speak. So if they say, you know, they want you, just go ahead, and, you know, that way they won't kill me because they want you. So Pharaoh did take Sarah into in, in his house for his wife. And, um, the Bible says that the Lord plagued Pharaoh's house. Even though Abraham lied and said, listen, this is my sister. It says the Lord still plagued Pharaoh's house. And then Pharaoh asked Abraham, why didn't you tell me this was your wife? You know, I've, I've gone through all this because I took her into my home, but you didn't tell me she was your wife. You said that she was your sister. Look, man, take your wife, take your stuff, take all the stuff that I gave you, and go. The Bible says that Abraham left, and he was rich in gold and cattle and silver because all the Pharaoh gave him. And guess who else was rich too? Lot. Lot was rich too, just because of his association with Abraham. So, Abraham's blessing came because the Bible says that he believed God. And it was accounted unto him for righteousness. It wasn't Abraham's obedience that made him righteous. Because we see there's some things that happen here. It wasn't his obedience that made him righteous. It's that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But yet there were no clear cut rules and, and um, regulations or guidelines as far as sin was concerned. You know, people were considering, okay, well, this is what we believe that God wants, and we're going to do it this way. And some people said, well, we're, we're, we, this is what we believe God wants, we're going to do it this way. And some were just going and doing their own thing because there were no clear-cut rules. Like these signs say, if you're in these rows, you come this way. If you're in that row, you go that way. Without the sign, you wouldn't know. So there were no clear-cut rules of what sin was or what transgression was. So God had to give the law. In order to let them know what was proper and what was holy in his sight. Galatians 3rd chapter 19, it says, the law was given alongside the promise. The promise is what the promise was to Abraham, that salvation would basically come through him. That was the promise. But it says the law was given alongside the promise to show people their sin. But it was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. We know that's Christ. Right? The Ten Commandments and also there were 613 other laws and rules that priests and rabbis gave were given to show people their sin, not to make people holy. It was shown to, get, to, to show them their sin. So this is also known as the Old Covenant. And it carried with it 
God's standards, the Ten Commandments. That's right. This was also a conditional covenant. Mm -hmm. It was do good, get good. Do bad, get bad. If you look at the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy, it will tell you everything. If you do all these things, you will be cursed. But if you do all these things, you will be blessed. It was a conditional covenant. The Mosaic covenant, the Ten Commandments, were all based on conditions. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, uh, verse 1, he begins giving out the Ten Commandments. So verses 1 through 17, God dispels the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. But in verse 24, he's already saying, now when the people sin, Moses, I want you to build a tabernacle, because he knew that man would not keep his commandments. So he had already told them, verse 17, he finished giving out the Ten Commandments. By verse 24, he was saying, now Moses, listen, I want you to build a tabernacle, because when they sin, we want you to, 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 to set up an altar and, and um, set up a veil and put all the stuff inside of this tabernacle so that people can go in once a year, for the sacrifice of sin. Also in this, in this tabernacle was a curtain. It was called the Holy of Holies. And th if I was to tell you everything inside of this tabernacle, we'd be here all day. There was so much, so many rituals and so many things to do inside of there. But the main part behind it was the Holy of Holies. There was a veil where God dwelt. And, and after the animal was slaughtered, only the priest could take the blood behind the veil to offer it unto God. And the Holy. He was the only one that could be, go before God's presence. And it was called the Holy of Holies, where the veil was. And so God was saying, here are my standards. They're righteous, they are pure, they are holy, and they are unchangeable, but I know you cannot keep it. So, year after year, once a year, bring sacrifices unto this temple so that the sins of the people may be covered. This old covenant with its rituals, with its rules, and with its details, still could not save the people. Amen. It would only cover their sins for a year. So once a year, they would go and get their sins covered, and it was called the Day of Atonement. But there yet needed to be a sacrifice for sin that would not only cover sin, but would take away sin once and for all. So now he has obtained a more excellent ministry for if the first covenant had been faultless, it's the old covenant, mm -hmm. then there would be no need for a second covenant. That's right. For this is the covenant that I will make after those days mm -hmm. when the Messiah is revealed, when Christ dies on the cross. Mm -hmm. This is the covenant he's going to make. Right. I will put my laws into their minds and into their hearts. I shall be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. This is the promise of the new covenant where we also take part. It is an unconditional covenant because God says, I will, I will, I shall, they shall, I will, I will. It's an unconditional covenant that God has made with us simply because of the three words that Christ uttered as he hung on the cross. He said, it is finished. It is finished. It means that everything that he came to do regarding the salvation of man and the forgiveness of sins is done, is complete, is finished. And it's not going to be a progressive finish like, okay, I did this and now as you grow and as you get better, you may get to the point where you're good enough for me to accept you. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the sins of the world are forgiven. It is finished. Faith in Christ is faith in what he has accomplished. Yeah. Faith in Christ is faith in what he has accomplished by his death burial and resurrection on the cross. It is finished. God has forgiven all sin before salvation, after salvation, past, present, and future. God's covenant people are never guilty before him. He has cast your sins as far as the east is from the west and will never charge you or punish you for sin because he says, I will. I will, I will, and I will. Amen. 
whether it's the old covenant sacrifice of animals or the new covenant sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross, one thing is for sure, that God has a blood requirement for the forgiveness of sins. It's a blood requirement for the forgiveness of sins. Whether it's the Day of Atonement once a year or Christ's death for all times, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. Yeah, they were sorry in the old covenant. They were sorry on the Day of Atonement, but they didn't offer a long list of apologies or they didn't make promises or plead or ask because they knew that the only thing that would take away their sin was blood. It was the blood of these bulls and the goats and the calves. It was the only thing that, I'm sorry, would cover their sin. The old covenant saints understood that. So if they sinned on the day after, um, on the day of atonement, they went home and sinned or had a fight and whatever, they understood that it wasn't until next year that I could get these sins covered. I had to wait a whole year. Whether, no matter how sorry they were, no matter how many times they asked, no matter how many times they pleaded or begged, they understood that it wouldn't be to another year that I could have these sins covered. Amen. Because if, those, if, those, if that sacrifice was good enough, they wouldn't have to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again, year after year after year after year after year. After year. They understood that it was just the blood of those animals that would forgive them. It included a special day, an altar, a sacrifice, and blood, period. This was God's way of letting them feel better about themselves. This was his way of making them feel better about themselves. Once a year, you get your sins covered. But we sometimes do, often do, what they knew not to do. We ask and plead and beg and bargain and promise to do better next time. Yes, we should feel bad about our sins. And yes, there will be some consequences. Listen, don't, don't, don't get forgiveness of sins mixed up with well, our pain earthly consequences. The two are totally different. That doesn't mean you can go, because listen, Paul was obviously preaching the same thing. And so people were probably telling Paul, wait a minute, are you saying that, you know, we can go ahead and sin now because you're saying that our sins are forgiven? That's when he said, what shall we say then? So shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? So therefore, if we are dead to sin, our lifestyle won't be a sin. Will we sin? Yes. But will we continue in sin if we are truly dead to sin? No. So therefore, again, some of us are doing what they knew not to do. We're begging and pleading and asking on a daily basis. And, um, but Still today, there's only one requirement for the forgiveness of sin. That's blood. So, let me ask some questions. Which blood sacrifice makes me forgiven of my sin? Is it the animal sacrifice or the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? Okay, if we've determined that it's Jesus on the cross, how many of my sins was this sacrifice offered for? One, two, seven, six. Oh. So will this sacrifice ever be repeated like the old covenant sacrifice? No. It will never be repeated. So if it will never be repeated, then what shall I determine about its effectiveness the first time it was done? That it is finished. The priest stood year after year. It says, once this man offered his life for the forgiveness of sins, he sat down on the right hand of God. We have all broken the Ten Commandments. Isaiah 53 says it like this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why he was wounded for our transgressions. That's why he was bruised for our iniquity. That's why the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are here. We, we were talking in, in, in choir yesterday about 
um, why did Jesus die on the cross? And the answer was to forgive our sins. And that, that conversation has become so matter-of-factly. Okay. He was talking. You know, we say Christ died on the cross to forgive our sins. Do we really know yeah. what he went through? Yeah. You know, it first started off when he was being dragged from judgment hall to judgment hall. These men who were possessed by the enemy mm-hmm. would punch him. And we, 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 don't read, we don't know about the in-between stuff. Punch him oh. anytime they got the chance. So by the time he got to Pilate, his face was probably already swollen and had contusions and eyes maybe come shut. On, on. They would kick him whenever they got the chance. They spit on him. It says they ripped out his beard. Jesus. Then they decided to whip him. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they, they got this whip called the cat and nine tails where you have different, you know, uh, strings yeah. hanging and they dip them in metal and the metal dries and, and when you hit, it goes into the skin. And when it hit, goes into the skin, when you pull it out, it pulls out flesh with it. And they did this over and over and over and over again. And Jesus, and he didn't have the loincloth on like we see on the cross. He was naked. It was a form of humiliation. And they whipped him and not saying, let's not hit his face. They, I'm sure they didn't say, we care about where we hit him. They just whipped. That's right. It could have hit him in the face. It could have been anywhere on his body. And if that wasn't enough, they made him carry a cross. I'm sure there were some dislocated joints, yep. some swelling, some infection from his back that looked like hamburger meat as he um, carried the cross. And yes, he fell. And he got up. And yes, he fell again. But he got up because he had to make it there for you. He had to make it there for you. He had to make it there for me. So he kept going. And he kept going. And he kept going. Until he reached a hill called Calvary. And if that wasn't, they took a crown of thorns. And then they pressed it on his head. And blood started coming out of his head, streaming down his face. All of this for us. Then, if that wasn't enough, they put, took eight inch spikes, nailed his hands and feet to a cross. And they mocked him. They despised him. They rejected him. They abused him. Until he cried out, It is finished. The Bible says that. The Bible says that when he cried, It is finished. That the veil in front of the Holy of Holies ripped from the top to the bottom. That was signifying that now it wasn't just the priest who could go before God. Because of Christ's death, now we could come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and that we may find grace in the time of need. Now there is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus because of, of Jesus Christ. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need sought for a second. For he says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. That's what it means by it is finished. Listen, it, it, this is what we need to tell our unsaved friends, our unsaved relatives and, and who are waiting to get themselves together. There is no more sacrifice for sin. That is it. Jesus has done his part on the cross. The sins of the world are forgiven. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His son died for the world. Now listen, the world's sins are forgiven, but only whosoever believes shall have everlasting life. Christ has already done his part. Forgiveness of sins does not mean going to heaven. Forgiveness of sins means that God has done his part, but whosoever believes shall have eternal life. So tell your unsaved loved one, look, this is it. God has already done his work through Christ. It's not about you getting yourself together. Come to him as you are. Let him do the work in your life and clean you up. He's already done the work. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain, but he washed it 
but he wants it. But he wants it. White ass no. Thank you, Lord. It is finished. But he's coming back. But he's coming back. He's sitting down in the right hand now, but he's coming back. And this time when he, come, and when he comes back, he's not coming back to deal with sin. He's done that. He's coming back for salvation. And when he comes back, he's coming back as king of kings. And he's coming back as Lord of lords. And he shall reign forever, forever, and ever. We shall forever be with the Lord. Thank God for the new and better covenant. Thank God for the new and better covenant that says it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. Thank God for the new and better covenant. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. work on the cross. Believe that everything for, that he has uh, given us for life and for godliness is already done. He's already done it. And so if you've never had the opportunity, if you've never, just, if you or you were thinking, well, I need to get myself a little bit better before I give my life to Christ or I need to get some things straight before I give my life to Christ, now we understand that he has already done the work. All he wants us to do is to come and accept his finished work on the cross. You look at the world today and all that's going on. You, we know that time is drawing near. Things are happening like never before. So God is calling us. He's calling us to a new and better covenant. So if you're out there and haven't decided to give your life to Christ based on you looking at yourself, Now's the time to understand that Christ, I yield, I yield, I yield unto you. For I know that you are my Savior and Deliverer. Is there one? Hallelujah. Is there one? Jesus made it all. All to me.
let us pray. Father, we thank you for the word. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. And now, Father, we come to give back a portion of that that you have given to us. And we ask that you allow us to do it with a clean heart, knowing that you know everything and all things belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
the blood that Jesus shed for me.
Lord, if we can sing that one more time like we mean it. Sing it, reach it. 